Hello, everyone. I'm Lori Isom from the University of Michigan, and it's my pleasure today to share our exciting new work with you um, on Tango, which may be the first precision, precision medicine therapy for Dravet syndrome. And I'd like to disclose that this work was funded by a research grant to the University of Michigan from Stoke Therapeutics. I don't have to tell anyone at this meeting that Dravet syndrome is a catastrophic epileptic encephalopathy. In addition to severe seizures, our patients have behavioral and developmental delays, speech issues, autism spectrum um, uh, symptoms, they have sensory disorders, balance issues, ataxia, sleeping difficulties, and a very high, in fact, maybe the highest risk of SUDEP or sudden unexpected death in epilepsy. And in spite of years of research on this disease, uh, these patients remain refractive, largely refractive um, to their seizures. We also all know that the target, uh, the gene target for Dravet syndrome and SC is SCN1A that encodes the voltage gated sodium channel NAV1.1. And everyone in this meeting also knows that the majority of these variants result in haploinsufficiency and nonsense media decay of the one allele that is affected by the variant. So we know from um, many years of sodium channel research that, that um, the variants um, occur all along the the gene, the amino acid sequence of SCN1A. And, and originally we were perplexed by how can a variant that happens at the end terminus have the same severe developmental disease as a variant that happens at the C terminus. And soon we learn that one allele of SCN1A is insufficient for normal neuronal function. And capital insufficiency or nonsense mediated decay of the variant allele results in disease. So the first evidence of haploinsufficiency of SCN1A in an animal model was published by my colleague Bill Catterall at the University of Washington. And he showed using a heterozygous knockout of SCN1A that he indeed saw uh, SUDEP, seizures and SUDEP in this model. You can see the EEGs here with generalized tonic-clonic seizures. He also measured voltage-gated sodium current um, in uh, that is generated by SCN uh, NAV1.1. And he did this in hippocampal neurons that were isolated from mice at postnatal day 14, or P14. And he looked at the pyramidals, or the excitatory neurons, and he saw no difference I mean, the current. So you can see the current voltage relationship. And really, without being um, an electrophysiologist, you can see that there were no differences in genotypes. But in the bipolar or GABAergic neurons, he saw a selective loss of sodium current. So here is the wild type, and here is the heterozygous and the homozygous null, which is not the disease model. But again, in the disease model, there was a decrease in sodium current density, and he interpreted it this to mean disinhibition. When he looked at um, action potential firing in the wild type, versus the HET or the disease model and the null, he saw a decrease in the amount of firing in the disease model. And you can see that quantified here. This is the, the disease model versus the wild type. And again, he interpreted this to mean a disinhibition of inhibitory neurons to cause over excitation of excitatory neurons. But this, the situation is more complex than that. So our colleagues Jennifer Carney and Al George at uh, Northwestern University developed a similar model. And instead of looking at postnatal day 14, they looked at postnatal day 21. So they waited a week because this is a developmental disease. And this time they saw the, the uh, decrease in sodium current in the bipolar neurons, but they, now they saw in addition an increase in sodium current in the pyramidal or the excitatory neurons. So, more complex. So they, um, it, it, they interpreted this as decreased sodium current in bipolar, so disinhibition, but also increased sodium current in the pyramidals 
for overexcitation. And then they saw if they isolated these neurons, so they saw spontaneous hyperexcitability um, in these excitatory pyramidal neurons. So hmm, what's going on? Well, we asked, and we meaning uh, my, my colleague Jack Parent and I asked, do mice appropriately model human neurological disease? Because mouse brain and human brain are really different. And the way that these brains develop are different and that the kinds of neurons in the brain are different. And so we decided to generate induced pluripotent stem cell neurons from patients with Dravé and compare them to similarly generated neurons from healthy human controls. And so I'll just show you one figure from our paper. And this work was done by Luis Lopez Santiago and Yukun Yuan in my laboratory. So they, Luis, uh, recorded sodium current in pyramidal or excitatory and bipolar or inhibitory neurons. And Yukun recorded action potential firing in the controls and the disease, uh, the, the disease neurons. And so what we saw, and you can see some really nice, beautiful neurons here um, in these micrographs, instead of a decrease in sodium current in the bipolar or inhibitory neurons, he actually saw an increase. And he saw it in two different DS patients compared to a group of controls which were not different from each other, so we lumped them, we uh, put them together. And then he saw similarly to um, one of the mouse models that I showed you, an increase in the pyramidal neurons. So we saw increases in sodium current in both kinds of neurons, excitatory and inhibitory. And then when Yukun looked at the action potential firing, comparing the control, the healthy neurons versus DS neurons, he saw increases in firing rate in response to injected current in both the pyramidals and the bipolars. And the take home message really is spontaneous hyperexcitability or spontaneous firing in both the excitatory and the inhibitory neurons. And so, in other words, we saw epilepsy in a dish. Now, my goal is to not confuse you, but to illustrate that the mechanism of Dravé is complex. There are neuron subtype specific effects on sodium current and excitability. So, is it interneurons? Is it pyramidal neurons? Is it both? What kind of interneuron subtype is most important? So a lot of literature has implicated parvalbumin or PV positive interneurons, but also there's new data showing that somatostatin or SST and VIP neurons, these are all interneurons, also play a role um, in the disease phenotype. We know that changes in excitability depend on the age of the animal and the neuronal maturity in IPS neurons is it neonatal versus adult, and that correlates with the human disease because it's a developmental epileptic encephalopathy. And then there are some conflicts, there's some cut caveats with the, the methods that are used. So if we look at brain slices in mice versus in vivo recording with uh, implanted electrodes, there are differences in the kind of excitability that we see. And then finally, there's model specific differences. Are we looking at what's the difference between mice and humans, and do the mice really model the human disease? And I, I published a, a review on epilepsy currents a number of years ago that proposed that perhaps we're all correct, because we're all modeling different aspects of a very complex and developmentally regulated disease. Now, we know that in spite of lots of drug discovery over the past 20 years, that very few small molecules or drugs um, help patients with Dravé. And most of these drugs, all of these drugs, really target the seizures, but they don't address the other presentations of Dravé, like developmental delays, um, uh, cognitive decline, intellectual disability, sleep disorders, SUDEP, mood disorders, growth defects, language and speech. So it's clear that we need a better therapeutic strategy that targets the genetic cause of Dravé, which is haploinsufficiency of SCN1A. So this is where our wonderful colleagues at Stoke Therapeutics come in. And they postulated the following. There are a group of genes in the brain, including SCN1A, that, in, that have in their genome um, a nonsense-mediated decay or a poison exon. So this is, remember, this is 
naturally occurring, and it's a way for the brain to precisely regulate the amount of SCN1A mRNA that's expressed. So if the non-productive mRNA is spliced in, it results in non-productive RNA and mRNA degradation. And I'll explain that in more detail in a minute. If the poison exon or the NMD exon is spliced out, it results in productive mRNA and NAD 1.1 protein. So this is a way that the brain can rheostat, so to speak, the amount of NAD 1.1 that's expressed in, in specific cells in the brain at different time points and for different needs. And so what our colleagues at Stoke did is they developed a drug, an antisense oligonucleotide that targets this, this nonsense mediated of decay or poison exon and prevents it from being expressed and pushes this mechanism toward um, splicing it out and resulting in productive mRNA and uh, much more, uh, an increase in NAV 1.1 protein. Okay, so let's talk about that in more detail. So TANGO, which is a, their, the um, acronym that Stoke developed, stands for Targeted Augmentation of Nuclear Gene Output. And what that means, the goal is to transform haploinsufficiency of SCN1A mRNA, which is 50% in a drug A patient, to 100%. And in so doing, transform the amount of NAD 1.1 protein, which is the business end, right? That's the important part, from 50% to 100%. And how did they do that? Well, could this cartoon helps. So as I told you before, inclusion of the nonsense mediated decay exon leads to transcript degradation. And that's because it makes a premature stop codon happen in the gene, and then this whole mRNA is targeted for nonsense mediated decay and no protein is made. And so this is how the brain uh, regulates expression of SCN1A during development. And the nice thing is that this NMD event is conserved in humans and non-human primates and mice. And we found it in cell lines and brain samples from controls and drug A patients. So what Stoke has done is they have developed an antisense oligonucleotide that sits on the NMD exon, prevents its expression, and makes it skip. So it pushes um, this, this process to the full length mRNA, which makes protein. Here's an illustration of what happens in the brain. So we, Stoke found, our colleagues found, that these, these species, the canonical splicing that makes productive mRNA and the um, non-productive mRNA are both found um, in brain. And if you use something to inhibit protein synthesis like cyclohexamide, you can amplify this to really measure it. And the um, remarkable thing is that this, um, this event was found in humans. Um, and this is a sample from a, a Drave brain, an autopsy sample in non-human primates or monkeys, in mice, and in rats. And here, this is a mouse development um, scheme where mice were tested at birth or postnatal day zero, this is day of birth, all the way out um, to 10 months. And they quantified the amount of each of these species. And you can see that quantified down here. So the, the amount of uh, the non-productive mRNA is relatively constant in the brain, but the amount of productive mRNA increases, and this is mice again, on to around postnatal day seven after the first postnatal week, and then plateaus. So what Stoke did is they did a chromosome walk, and they walked across this exon, and they tested different antisense oligonucleotides for um, decreased inclusion of the poison exon or the NMD exon, and maximized production of the productive SCN1A mRNA. And they tested many, many oligonucleotides, and they came up with this one, ASO22, which had the, the biggest reduction in the uh, inclusion of the NMD exon and the biggest, uh, the greatest maximization of the uh, increase in protein. Important that they looked at many other uh, SCN channels alpha subunit channels that are uh, sodium channels that are expressed in brain. And they only saw this dose-dependent increase in SCN1A 
but not 2A, 3A, 8A, or 9A. Very important. And un another also important is that the sequence um, of uh, ASO22 was perfectly conserved in mouse and human SCN1A. So that immediately lent itself to translation. So then we did the ex important experiment in mice, and these are wild type C57 black 6J mice where we looked at SCN1A, mRNA, and NAD1.1 protein. And here, the study design is at postnatal day two, so two days after birth, the ASO was injected um, directly into the brain, or ICD. And then the mice were euthanized at postnatal day seven, one week later, and we looked at SCN1A transcript, we looked and, and we found dose-dependent decrease in the amount of the non-productive transcript or the NMD transcript, a dose-dependent increase in the productive or full-length transcript, and a, a dose-dependent increase in NAD1.1 protein. So that's the important take-home message. We also did a very extensive specificity assay with all known sodium channel genes. You can see them here. Um, they're represented below in a dose-dependent way. And again, only SCN1A was affected um, in a dose-dependent way by this ASO injection. And we settled on one dose. This was 10 micrograms of ASO22, and we injected it into the mice at postnatal day two. And we looked at postnatal day three, five, seven, 12, 22, and 32 for increases in SCN1A transcript, okay, the productive, and the take-home message, NAV1.1 protein. And we saw it at, um, it was long, so it was long lasting and dose dependent. Then it was important to go into a drug A model. And for this model, we used Jennifer Carney's model, which is a um, F1 cross um, of a SCN1A knockout um, uh, with uh, C57 black 6J and 129. And this is a knockout of exon 1. Um, of SCN1A, and we use the heterozygous animals. Now, it's important to see here, this is a trigger warning, this, these are seizures you're going to see in this video. Um, these mice have spontaneous seizures that begin around postnatal day 18 to 20, um, and then they rapidly progress. The majority of these mice, um, the tonic-clonic generalized seizure ends in SUDEP, and you can see the SUDEP there with the hind limb flexion of this mouse. So there are spontaneous seizures, SUDAP, and cognitive and behavioral deficits that have been described in this mouse model. You can see here with a Western blot for protein of NAD1.1, with a wild type, you see the, the full um, amount of protein, but in the, in the knockout or the HET, you see HAP. So that's HAP loan sufficiency of NAD1.1. So we did the important experiment in my lab, and this work was largely done by Chengling Chen in my lab where she injected on cohorts of mice at postnatal day two. We began survival monitoring at postnatal day 17. We euthanized one cohort of mice at seven weeks and another cohort of mice at 14 weeks. You can see the Kaplan-Meier survival curve here. So the wild type mice survived all the way to uh, 90 days. And the DS model, which we expected from Jennifer Carney's previous work, the majority of these mice uh, died of, of SUDEP um, around by around postnatal day 30. So the important take home message here is that the ASO treated DS mice survived. And we actually, of the cohort of 34, we lost one mouse to SUDEP during this experiment. And um, also important is that the wild type mice treated with the ASO compound had no toxicity. When we looked at seven weeks and 14 weeks, sorry, down here, um, at the amount of, uh, AS, of um, SCN1A, mRNA, and protein, we saw increases. It went from 50% to 100% um, in, in the DS mice. Now, we also saw increases in the wild type um, with the ASO treatment. Um, but as you can see here, there was no toxicity. So even though there was increased amounts of mRNA and protein, it didn't affect adversely the wild type mice, but it did save the majority, 97% um, of the DS mice. Then we did, because we know that um, this is not really, P2 is not really close to time of disease onset at around 
postnatal day 20. So we did another experiment where we injected at postnatal day 14. Okay, and we injected more because the mice are larger at that point. And then we began survival monitoring right away and we euthanized at P35 and P90, just like the previous experiment. So you can see here that we, we were able to get a significant um, survival of the DS mice. It wasn't as good as the P2, but it was still significant. And we saw similar increases in SCN1A, mRNA, and NAD1.1 protein. We also wanted to look electrographically at the seizures. So we did an experiment where we injected the mice here at postnatal day two, um, like the first experiment I showed you. And then we instrumented them with EEG electrodes at postnatal day 20 and started continuous EEG monitoring two days later. And we continued this out to postnatal day 46. So we saw some significant results. The number of seizures in the ASO treated DS mice were significantly reduced versus PBS treated. Um, and the latency to first seizure was significantly prolonged in the ASO treated mice versus the PBS treated mice. Now, importantly, if the mice seized, you can see that here. Here's an electrographic seizure in a DS mouse that was only injected with PBS vehicle um, and a seizure that was. Uh, in, an, in an ASO injected mice, mouse. So even though they seize very infrequently, if they do seize, these are electrographically indistinguishable from the untreated mice. We then did a long experiment with video monitoring under infrared video of um, a number of cohorts of mice. So we injected the mice either at P2 with 20 micrograms of ASO, this is ICD, and we had 19 mice in this cohort. Or we injected 11 mice at P14 with 60 micrograms of, of um, ASO, so more because they're larger mice. And then we had a small cohort, just four mice, um, where we're only injected with vehicle, and we injected them at P14. And then we monitored them, and this is one of my master's students um, who went through all of these videos very painstakingly. So while I don't have time to show you any of the videos, this is what we found. So we saw the single tonic-clonic seizure followed by SUDEP in two of the four vehicle injected mice, so 50%, like we, predict, we predicted, we always see that. But in the P2 injected mice, we only saw this uh, seizure and SUDEP in one of the 19. And of the P14 injected mice, we saw the seizures and SUDEP in two of 11. So again, significant difference um, in survival um, between the, the vehicle treated and the ASO treated. This work led Stoke Therapeutics to do um, a safety study in non-human primates. So this is not a disease, this is not a Dravet model. These are wild type non-human primates, but they did studies to look at safety and they used single and multiple dose regimens to look at toxicology, and they saw that it was well tolerated. So this is ASO 22, which is now called STK001, which is the drug. And they found no observed adverse effects at the highest dose that they tested, no change in platelet counts or renal or hepatic function, and no adverse histopathology in the brain, spinal cord, liver, and kidney. Now they did another study where they went to extremely high doses to see what would happen. They did see some, some hind, hind limb paresis, uh, here and some acute convulsions. But again, this dose was, was higher than any human would ever receive. So this work taken together led to three phase 1-2A clinical trials that had been either approved or authorized. And that's the Monarch study, the Swallowtail study, and the Admiral study. And more details are here. So the Monarch study and the Swallowtail study have been approved and are ongoing um, they are FDA approved and are ongoing in the United States. And these are open label evaluation of single and multiple ascending doses of STK001. The uh, Monarch study is a single dose and the Swallowtail study is multiple ascending doses. And you can see the target enrollment here um, and the safety and tolerability that they are looking for and changes in seizure frequency over 12 weeks with quality of life measures. And we, we expect to have initial data um, by the end of this current year. And it's, these studies are currently enrolling. 
Now, the Admiral study was recently um, authorized in the UK, and its enrollment and dosing is anticipated to begin in the second half of 2021. So this is open label, multiple ascending doses of SDK-001 in children and adolescents aged two to 18. And it'll be the same, the same um, outcome, similar outcomes to the, the um, Monarch and Swallowtail studies. So in conclusion, 90% of patients with Drave are not well controlled for seizures with current standards of care in spite of novel drug discovery. Um, but Tango, SCN1A targeting Tango ASL or STK001 demonstrates gene-specific mechanism-based upregulation of SCN1A productive mRNA and NAD1.1 protein in Drave mice, resulting in seizure reduction and pseudoprevention. prevention. So this technology hopefully will provide the first disease-modifying approach in a precision medicine approach to restore physiological levels of NAD1.1 protein to prevent seizures and pseudep risk in a wide range of drug A patients with SCN1A variants that result in NAD1.1 papillon insufficiency. And, and these patients will include those with variants that are truncating, non-sense of frame shift, or partial or whole gene deletion. But it's important to remember that Tango, this approach is likely contraindicated for patients with missense SCN1A variants that result in the generation of NAV1.1 protein because these polypeptides may have maladaptive gain of function or dominant negative effects. And so if the tango mediated increase in this allele may increase this maladaptive protein expression and increase disease severity. So for that reason, all the clinical trials using this approach um, require that patients are genetically screened and those with known maladaptive gain of function or dominant negative mutations are excluded. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge the wonderful people in my laboratory who have done this work. Um, Chung Ling Chen and Kachi Animonwo did uh, the, large, the share of this work in my laboratory for this ASO. Again, this work was funded by a grant from Stoke Therapeutics and here's a list of our wonderful collaborators. Um, who did this work. Uh, Johan is the first author um, on our paper. We give special thanks to DS patients and their families and the rest of our wonderful uh, uh, funders. So with that, I'd like to thank you and take questions.